watch. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much for the invitation. And um, I've been asked if I minded it being recorded this morning. And I don't mind at all because if it's no good, you can always wipe it. <laughs> Yes, well, praise God. Now, just before I get to preaching, um, we were praying, weren't we, from Isaiah 8 earlier. Mm -hmm. And something that I've, um, not in this Bible, but I've got a little pocket Bible. And pocket Bibles are not usually pretty good, but the maps in my little one are very good. And I noticed something, that the heartland of Isis mm. corresponds to the expanded kingdom of Assyria. Mm. Chapter 8 of Isaiah, basically, God's saying, you'll have your day, but I'm going to call you to account, mm -hmm. and sooner or later you'll come to nothing. Amen. So I would, just for your um, just for your own interest, why not read the book of Nahum? Because, mm -hmm. not now, but because I'm not going to preach from Nahum. <laughs> I'm just saying, just, just consider for yourself. I'm not saying this is the case. It's just something that I felt I was impacted with. The fact that the kingdom, the Assyrians were ruthless people. They were brutal. Mm -hmm. And we've seen this with this group called ISIS. Mm -hmm. Brutal in their treatment of people. Absolutely horrendous some of the things they've done. But I believe their power is it's peaking and it won't last forever. And if you read if you read Nahum, you will see a prophecy against the Assyrians, and although it was in that day specific, we know that biblical prophecy is multi-layered. It meant something at the time to those people, but there are principles of it that are applying to our day because all Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for us, isn't it? So therefore, just for your own consideration, have a look at that and see what God planned for the Assyrians and you just see if that will prompt your prayer in re like we did this morning in respect to Assyria, in respect to ISIS. Okay? Right, here we go then. My title is very simple this morning, and that's this. God wants to do something in you this morning because he wants to do something through you. He wants to do something in you, not just for you, but because he wants to do something through you. Did you know it was ordained by God that you came into Chesterfield and established this work? I'm sure you did, otherwise you wouldn't have done it. But I believe God is saying, be encouraged this morning, because you're here to broaden the outlook, broaden the understanding of the people of Chesterfield, and in particular, the church folk of Chesterfield, who have become very parochial very inward looking and the fact that you are multinational is a, an additive into the mix in this town to cause the town to think bigger than itself to start to look outwardly to, to realize that Chesterfield is not all that there is but it's an important place as a springboard for ministry and you are bringing a new flavor to the whole which will benefit everyone. You will both receive from and bestow to others the grace of God in a variety of ways. So that we're not no longer parochial, no longer just this little place, but we start to think in a multinational, 
international way. It's interesting, Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, unto the ends of the earth. So it had to be the local, it had to be the regional, it had to be the national, and it had to be international. And that's what you are here, you're helping already, but it will expand so that the people in the churches will not just think of their church. They'll start to think more about the kingdom of God, which the church is here to bring in, and you're part of the seasoning of that to make it much more a reality than it's already been. In Psalm 42, I'll begin there. Psalm 42. I don't know how far we'll get this morning, <clears throat> but we will have a go. Michael Card, an American singer, has a song and it says, There is a joy in the journey. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. I, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts of songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. The New American Standard says there, Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. Mm. Hallelujah. Mm. Are you thirsty this morning? Yes. It's interesting, you know, that God sometimes puts us through things, allows us to go through dry places for the single purpose of developing a thirst. Mm. The gospel was never meant for those who were interested. It was meant for the thirsty and the hungry. For those, if they don't get this message, they'll die. God's after hungry people. Many will pass a, a, a passing interest in the teachings of Jesus, in his ministry and life. But it's one, those who are desperate, those who are hungering and thirsting after righteousness, those are the ones, the Bible says in Matthew 5, who will be filled. Are you thirsty this morning? He yes. says it's interesting, the psalmist here can remember better days. He remembered when he led the procession up to the house of the Lord, they were praising God and enjoying His presence and enjoying one another in the worship. He led it. And now it's come to nothing. Oh, we've had better days than this. And we start to remember the good times. And we start to despise the day we're in. Because it's hard and heavy for us. It's dry and dusty. The circumstances of life have closed in. Disappointments have hit. There's been pain. Grief sometimes. <coughs> Challenges along the way. Children that won't behave themselves or wander off. All this kind of stuff hits people. And this psalm, is, that's why I like the psalms. It gives a, a phenomenal impression of who God is. But it also is very true about humanity and how frail we are without the Lord. And here this psalmist can remember. And what's he saying? My soul thirsts for God. I don't want sermons. I don't want anything else. I want Him. I have to have Him. I have to have the Lord, I have to be in relationship with Him. There's only Him and contact with Him that's going to make any difference. I'm so thirsty for Him. Pouring out His soul. Have you ever been there? Are you there this morning, perhaps? Yeah. Longing for something. You've prayed for something, prayed for something, and it's not happened. In fact, you've received a prophetic word, and usually when that happens, Everything goes the opposite way to the prophetic word, does it not? 
seems to, doesn't it? Yes. Because the devil wants to rob us of that which God has spoken. And faith says, I'm not going to be dissuaded, I'm going to go for it. That's why we need to mix with people of faith. Because they will, when we're weak, they can be our stabilizing influence. I need to go to a brother or a sister or pray for me and say, look Peter, I know you're struggling at the moment, but it's not over till God brings the triumph. <laughs> the only thing you don't, mustn't do is quit. Don't quit. Say to one another now, don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Say it again to one another. Whatever you do, don't quit. Don't quit. If you refuse to quit, it's not over until you triumph. Yes. Amen. It's not over till you triumph if you refuse to quit. Hallelujah. What is this psalm about? It's about learning to be dependent upon the Lord. We need Him. Margaret probably know that again. I need you. Every hour I need you. And we do. And God's arranged it that way. Well, it, it's not a secret really, but I used to be a school teacher. Oh my God! <laughs> And I used to have a cane. <laughs> and I knew how to use it. But <laughs> when they banned the cane, and all the enjoyment had gone out of teaching, so I backed in. <laughs> I want that. God called me out of teaching. And in 1988, I quit teaching. In a school, that is. And I want you to know, I've never had a salary from that day to this. But God's kept me. Amen. God has kept me. Amen. And I once said to the Lord, you know what, if you gave me a million pounds, I could invest that, and then I wouldn't have to bother you. <laughs> and his response was, I know. <laughs> Honestly, that's what he said, I know. He wants me to be reliant upon him. Amen. Why do I have to trust you for the gas bill? <laughs> because if you're learning to trust me for your daily provision you'll trust me when you're ministering to someone that's in need when you have to go on a journey and you don't know where you're going you'll have learned to trust me you trust me in the ordinary then you can trust me for the other things that's why this psalmist was crying out to God he knew he needed God. He wasn't feeling particularly great at the time. Have you ever been like that? Oh no, you're all fab down here, aren't you? It's only us in clay cr clay crops. <laughs> that feel like we're in great need of God's presence. We all need it. Don't we? Interestingly, the history of the church is that we the church has needed God most when they're successful. Because it's when they're successful that they tend to forget him. Yeah. <laughs> Success is a challenge as much as when we are in need. Mm. Praise God. Mm. So we're thirsty. Let me take you now to John chapter 7. Because God wants to do something this morning. He wants to quench Amen. some thirst this morning. Thank you, Lord. You can hide behind this pillar, but I can't hide from toy in the ground. I'm retrospectively worried. <laughs> <coughs> Verse 37. I'm reading and have been for about 10 years now the new, uh, sorry, the English Standard Version. And it is a, um, a word for word translation. And uh, I know that you're using King James up here. But this is the one I've been using for a while. I tend to use that, the King James and the New American Standard. Just try and get a bit of a play. Occasionally the NIV. But uh, those are the ones I use mainly. But here we are, verse 37. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, 
If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart, out of his belly, out of his inmost being, will flow rivers of living water. Now he said this about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Praise God, Jesus has been glorified. Amen. So we can receive of his Spirit today. But it's interesting, the context of that passage. It was the Feast of Tabernacles at the time. And on the last, great, this great day of the feast, what the priests used to do was go from the temple with a golden urn, a golden ewer. And they went to the pool of Siloam and filled it with water and they brought it back to the temple and they poured it out on the steps of the temple as a prophetic reenactment of Ezekiel's prophecy in chapter 47 about the river flowing from the temple and uh, outwards towards the Arabah, the desert region where the Dead Sea is. In chapter 47, the first 12 verses, I'll, I'll tell you about that river that Ezekiel saw in vision form. And while they were doing it, they would be reading or, or chanting from Isaiah 12. Just have a look at Isaiah 12. Well, not, but I'll just <coughs> remember it. It says, with joy you shall draw water from the springs of salvation. That's what they were chanting, with joy. You shall draw water from the spring of salvation. But the word for salvation there is Yeshua. So Jesus stood up on that day, the day when they would do that, when they were pouring it out, and he was saying, the living water, your refreshment, salvation comes not from a place, but from a person. It's found in me. Is anybody thirsty this morning? Jesus says, come to me. Not to the temple. Come to me and drink. And what happens? Look at the economy of our God. Come to me and drink. I know. How much can you drink? A bucket full, I bet. Pass it with lemonade or Coca-Cola, I know. But I, I can't drink very much at a time. But we drink. I'll have a drink or a mug of tea, one of my favourites. <laughs> His favourite too, <didn't> exactly. <laughs> so I, I like that. But the economy of God, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink. And the one who drinks out of his belly flows rivers. Well, I've only had a drink. But in the economy of God, those who receive from him, something takes place on the inside so that out of that one drink, out of that little amount, flows a huge amount that's multifaceted, multidimensional. We come to Jesus for a drink. And out of us flow rivers of living water. Now, he wasn't talking about natural water. He was talking about the Holy Spirit. So we come to Jesus this morning. If you're thirsty... It's no point unless you're thirsty. And I believe God wants me to minister a fresh touch to those who are thirsty. That they may be filled to overflowing once again with the Holy Spirit. You understand, I'm not saying you're not filled with the Spirit. But sometimes we just need that refreshing to get the overflow going again. To get the pump prime. Spring up, oh well. How about doing that at home when you're feeling a little bit down and flat? Speak to your own soul. The psalmist is full of it. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Verse 5 of that portion I started with. Hope in God. In other words, get going again. Spring up, oh well. I love that portion where David and his men... They were on the run and they ended up at Ziklag. And it was burned with fire. And all the possessions 
and their families have been taken away. And things got so bad, his own men spoke of stoning him. And so what did he do? It's so precious. And I don't find many Christians able to do this. It says, he encouraged himself in the Lord. He strengthened himself in the Lord, is another version. And then he didn't take any action until he consulted God. Shall we go and get back this stuff? And the Lord said, you go, you get it all back. And they did. And more besides. But he, he learned how to encourage himself in the Lord. And you might be struggling at the moment. You might be on top form. But sooner or later, you're going to have to have need to be able to encourage yourself in the Lord. There are sometimes you can't call the pastor. You can't call the prayer warriors. All there is is you when you're in the shower. And you need to lay hands on yourself. And encourage yourself in the Lord. You know, speaking in tongues is a great gift. Why? It's the one gift in all that list in 1 Corinthians 12 whereby we can encourage ourselves. Build ourselves up. Hallelujah. So are you thirsty this morning? Hallelujah. It's interesting that 1 Corinthians 10 tells us that when they were going through the wilderness, there was a rock that followed them. That's an interesting concept, isn't it? And the rock was Christ. Yes. And of course, with Moses, what flowed out of the rock? Water flowed out of the rock. We're coming to the rock. In fact, Toyne, as she was praying, mentioned so many names of Jesus. My hair was standing on end. It didn't go very far, like, but it was standing on end. Why? There are so many names of Jesus, all depicting a facet of our God. And what, what did she say? He's the rock of ages. Rock of ages. It's the same rock that Moses had to deal with, is our Jesus. <coughs> Hallelujah. What does he want to do? He wants to pour out into your life and into mine this morning. Why? He wants to do something in you today because he is desperate to do something through you. He wants to do something in us so we can do something through us. Have you ever wondered why the angel who went to Cornelius' house didn't just tell him the gospel? The angel said to him, send for Peter, who was in Joppa. Why not just tell him? Surely the angel knew the gospel. But he didn't tell him, did he? He went through this rigmarole. Mind you, God was changing the mindset, of course, of Peter. Who until that point wouldn't go near a Gentile. <laughs> like a divine pincer movement. You've got the Holy Spirit going on Peter from one angle, and he's speaking to Cornelius from this angle, and there was going to be a divine meeting in his house when he spoke the gospel they believed and were filled with the Holy Spirit. Gentiles! I'll ask the Lord, why didn't you just speak the gospel through the angel? He said, because I want my children involved in all I'm doing. That was his answer. I want my children involved. Why didn't you just send a bunch of angels into Mansfield yesterday? Why? Because, well, they may have been there. They may have been there. But he wanted his children to proclaim their father, their elder brother. He wanted his children to do it. Why is that? Well, it's just like when my son serviced the car. He was 10 years old. I just made sure the brakes were okay and the wheels were on. <laughs> now my eldest son, he's an, he's an academic, he is not technical. He has, pop, he has problems with ballpoint pens. But not Andrew. Andrew was the mechanic, Man, Andrew was the practical one. And when he'd done it, that's my boy. Don't you think our Heavenly Father thinks like that? When you're speaking of his eldest son, his only begotten son to someone, that's my daughter. My daughter went that one to the Lord. 
My daughter prayed for that sick person and they got well. My son did that. Oh, that's one of mine doing that. Look at them praising me, my sons and daughters. Yeah, the angels do it all the time. But my kids, they've chosen to do it. Don't you think he's so pleased when we honor him by obeying him? He's so thrilled. That's one of mine. The same DNA that's in me is in them. And it's starting to show. Oh, yes. And Father talks to the only begotten Son. They talk to the Holy Ghost. And they have a party and the angels join in. Why? Because the kids are at work. It's a day to grow up, isn't it? You know, if we had a two-year-old child that weighed eight pounds, it wouldn't be a blessing, would it? It'd be a tragedy. They're all right if they're born at eight pounds, or for you girls, perhaps a bit less. But if they stayed like that, it would be a tragedy. It, there would be a problem. But so often in our churches, we've got folk that stay as infants forever. And it's a day to grow up. And I'll tell you what. God wants to do something in you Amen. because he wants to do something Amen. through you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. I'm, oh dear. <clears throat> Isaiah 41, please. And I'll, I'll try and be as quick as possible. Do you know the definition of optimism? The definition of optimism is when a lady puts her shoes back on when the preacher says, and finally. <laughs> Did you know there's not much difference between a long sermon and a hostage situation? <laughs> Verse 17 of Isaiah 41. Now this is where we're going. <laughs> When the poor and needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue is parched with thirst, I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers on the bare heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. I will put in the wilderness the cedar, the acacia, the myrtle, and the olive. I will set in the desert the cypress, the plain, and the pine together, that they may see and know, may consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this, and the Holy One of Israel has created it. Did you know, in this very town, in this region, there are ever so many people who are poor and needy and they're seeking water and they're not finding it. Mm. Now you can put anything in there that that water could mean. Mm. Fulfillment in life, hope, many folk, no hope at all. Mm. These, three, these three remain. Mm. Faith, hope and love. And the greatest of these is love. There are people who don't have any of those. They are desperately thirsty. And that's only ministered through the Spirit. Through people, not angels. Angels help us. They do. I believe in angels. But we're called to do it. You know, the Great Commission was not the Great Suggestion. There's nothing better to do. No. This is what we're going for. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. God knows and God's going to answer. Why? Because he loves people. He doesn't see them as notches on Bibles. He sees them as individuals and he knows names. And it's not just those who are believers that he knows the name. He knew my name before I ever believed. He knows our names. Every single person is important to the Lord. Everyone. Every single one. Well, even those that are really terrible. Even those. You know, if you saved Saul, converted, became Paul, through which we get most of our New Testament theology, he says that he was the chief of sinners. Now, I thought I was bad. But 
Paul says he was the chief one. So there's hope for us all, isn't there? Even those, even those in ISIS, if they will turn, if they will repent, if they will seek the Lord, he'll receive them. Sometimes it's a bit much for us to believe, but it is true if we if we go by this word. Which of course we want to do. He says, I'm going to answer them, and this is what he's going to do. I will open rivers on the bare heights. And fountains in the midst of the valleys. I'll make the wilderness a pool and the dry land springs of water. How on earth is he going to do it? I'll tell you this. I've had in my imagination, I don't know if you think pictorially, I imagine all sorts of things. And an old friend of mine said, Peter, don't be afraid of your thoughts. Because some of my thoughts, if I said them in a church meeting, you'd stone me to death. Because <laughs> so, I do get weird and wonderful, but in the mix, I'm wanting, through godly counsel, to sift through that which is a cheese dream and that which is from the Lord. Because we get them all, don't we? Yeah. And we need to be able to discern, and so I'm asking God to help me. But I imagined that right up on Bailey Moor, all of a sudden there'd be waterfalls coming down Lodge Road and down into Holy Moor side and all of that. And there'd be fountains springing up, not just Emperor Fountain in Chatsworth, but all over the place. But, and I'm thinking, how's this going to happen? Jesus said, if you're thirsty, come unto me and drink. And out of your belly will flow rivers. This is what God's saying to us. I'm going to do this through my people. The rivers are within them to flow out. I'm sending them onto the barren hills. I'm sending them into the places where folk have no hope. I'm sending them into the desert regions where faith seems to have been so covered over, we wonder if it'll ever come back again. Those that are sick and, and, and marginalized, I'm sending my people to them so the rivers that are flowing out of my people in these places are going to bring that hope, going to bring that refreshing, going to bring that salvation, going to bring that deliverance and healing to the people that are crying out for it. You may have not heard that cry, but God has heard the cry. And sometimes we wonder why we've got a nudge in the middle of the night, like you had a nudge about that offer. Mm. I can't say that. <laughs> like words of knowledge, Mark, some of you may have heard this. A friend of mine out in Norway, this lady came into the church. She wasn't a member of the church. She was with another lady who was. They were sisters. And he looked at her and immediately in his mind he had a vision of half a coat on her. And the Lord said, go and tell her that you see half a coat hanger concerning her. What? What? What's that? So he went down and said, excuse me, I don't know you, my name is... Excuse me. <laughs> That's reminding me, I've got a little bit of time left. <laughs> he said, uh, <clears throat> my name's Anna Scarlett. I used to be pretty nice name. He said, I've been looking at you, and the Lord showed me this vision of half a coat hanger. And Jesus said, he's got the other half. And this woman screamed and ran out of the building. I said, well, that went well, what? <laughs> and then this other woman, who was her sister and a member of the church, went out after her. It transpired, when they were talking, that on the way to the meeting, the, the woman that had run out had said to her sister, well, life's all right for you. You've got a nice husband and a nice job. You've got a nice house, lovely family. You've got a nice car. You're coming to your nice church to meet all your church friends. My life's falling apart. It's like a suit hanging on half a coat oh. She said it in the car. Oh. Anyway, Anna Scarvin went out and led her to the Lord in the car park. Amen. Amen. Amazing. Oh. Yeah. Why do we walk at it? Because it wasn't for us. It was for someone else. And God's training us to be a little bit more courageous. Because if we get it wrong, we'll say, please forgive me, I got that one wrong. And now, they don't stone prophets that get it wrong. I, the Lord, do not change. 
I am not a man that I should lie, mm. or the son of man that I should repent. Mm. Who prophesied that? Do we believe that's true? Yes. Amen. It was spoken by a false prophet. His name was Balaam. Is it the word of the Lord? Yes, it is. Why was he false then? He was false because of his heart was greedy and after money, not after the purposes of God. But the word he spoke was true. Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked here as I often do. The, 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 um, the people that are crying out will be met. But it won't be on something that's done geographically. What will happen is the people of God will get so thirsty that they'll come to Jesus time and again for a drink. They themselves will be refreshed. The rivers will start flowing again. And you'll be sent to people to help them. Sent to people to refresh them. You see, I don't believe it's the pastor's job to do all your believing, all your preaching, all your ministering. The, pre the, the pastor is here as a five-fold ministry gift to the church to enable you to do it. In fact, the major job of an evangelist is not to be a Billy Graham, although praise God for Billy Graham. It's actually to train the church to be evangelical. A prophet's job is not primarily to say, thus says the Lord. A prophet's job in the New Testament is to equip the people to be prophetic. <clears throat> oh, so Ephesians 4, 11 tells us. Oh, great things are going to happen because of a people overflowing with this river of life. Amen. Now notice, if we remember where that river from the temple went, and where's the temple now? We're the temple of the living God, are we not? Yes. Living stones fitted together. Yes. There's a flow going on from him to us, through us, to the world. Why? To change things. And if it's a, 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 a parable, that, that if, uh, the um, Ezekiel 47 picture, what it's talking about is everywhere that river went, life came, life came, life came, life came. Life came. Smith Wigglesworth of old used to say this, if you do not minister life, you will minister death. There's no middle ground. And I'm looking at a people who have got life. It's divine life. It's the life of Jesus inside of you. And it's a day to get that refreshed. Why? Because you're going to bring that life, that river of life to people. Now just to conclude, look at this. Verse 19. I will put in the wilderness... The cedar, the acacia, the myrtle, and the olive. I will set in the desert the cypress, the plain, and the pine together. That they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this, the Holy One of Israel has created it. Those trees don't grow in deserts. You see, what we're tapping into is the supernatural, spiritual power of God that causes things to happen where they can't naturally happen. You could say that through the people of God and the power of Jesus on the cross who actually finished it, but for us to enact it, it's a reversal of the curse. Whenever you get desert situations, briars and thorns, it's symptomatic of the curse way back in Adam's day. But thank God for the last Adam who came to redeem us from the curse and bring us into blessing. So grateful for the first miracle of Jesus. Water into wine. <clears throat> what was the water? It was for purification. So the purification's over now, boys. My blood has sealed it. I've cleansed you. My blood has sealed it. This is before he went to the cross. It was a prophecy. Now we're in days of celebration. We're celebrating that Jesus has done it all. Amen. The church now have to minister it to a dying world. God wants to do something in you this morning. And the simple reason is this. He wants that flow to be so strong out of you that people around you will be blessed. Hope will return. Faith will come. People's bodies will be healed. Who? Oh, through the anointed healer of the church. Yeah, it's called you.
because we are all competent as ministers of this new covenant. Who makes us com competent? Oh. He does. Father, we give you thanks this morning for your precious word. We want to thank you that your word is true. Where our lives are not congruent with your word, we ask you to forgive us and help us to get back into line. Father, this morning, would you release your Holy Spirit again to us to refresh us, to quicken us again, bring life again to us, that we might be the very distributors of that life wherever we go. Father, not to be judgmental of people in their circumstances, but to meet them with compassion just as Jesus did. Meet them with a word of hope, with a word that the future is better than the past. We thank you, Father. We are heading towards the fullness of the kingdom here on planet Earth. So, Father, we look to the day when we will see in every strata of society in this region, Chesterfield area, people changing from death to life, from Satan to God, from darkness to light. Oh, Jesus, we thank you. Now, my invitation, if you would like me to pray, Tony, there are others who will pray, just going to simply pray that you will receive a new refreshing of the Holy Spirit so that the flow can come from you greater than it's ever been before. And we thank you, Jesus.